presenting? What sort of figure is this? We're going to return to the title page of the first folio by William Shakespeare. And we're going to pay attention to this engraving by Martin Drossout the Younger. In the dedication to the reader, Ben Jonson calls the engraving a figure. This figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he had hit his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. But, since he cannot, reader, look not on his picture, but his book. I'm going to ask a question I don't think anybody has ever asked before. What type of figure is it? There are close to 200 types of rhetorical figures, and most are Greek or Latin. The most comprehensive treatment of rhetoric was written by Quintilian, who lived from 35 to 100 AD in 12 books. And on the left we see the title page of a 1567 edition published in Venice. Let's look at the definition of figure. Figure, now. A person as contemplated mentally, image, representation rather of human form, statue, person in picture, emblem, type, simile, diagram, illustrative drawing, decorative pattern. Notice these three definitions are about abstract resemblances emblem, type, simile. This is the word as a transitive and intransitive verb. Figure, represent in diagram or picture, picture mentally, imagine often to oneself, be symbol of, represent typically, embellish with pattern, cipher, figure up, reckon amount of, Make appearance, appear, figure as, pass for, assume character of, be conspicuous. Are these sub-definitions what Johnson meant? Let's look at it as a verb in transitive and transitive. Be symbol of, cipher, appear, pass for, assume character of, be conspicuous. Our task is to find out what type of figure Johnson meant. I believe he gives us clues in the poem. And the odd grammar in the title page where he puts published according to the true original copies. Let's see what we can find. As per the letter acrostic down the side of the dedication to the reader, we look for two perspectives. On line one, we see, thou here seest put. I looked at this and I thought that that was an odd way to put it. But this is an example of anastrophe in which two words are in reverse order. What we should read is, Thou seest put here. But instead we get, Thou here seest put. I believe that this phrase is an example of gradation or climax, in which we have to emphasize each word individually by pausing at greater length between them than you would when you normally read the line. As in this figure that thou here 
seest put. And notice too that figure begins with that uppercase F. Thou means the reader. Here, of course, means the page opposite to the one where the poem is on. In the context of the title page, I think it seest means to look closely because, of course, when you're using gradation or climax, you want each word to have more emphasis than the word previous to it. And then finally, the word put means laid down. Therefore, we can interpret line one as, reader, look closely at this figure which we placed on the page. Johnson states it was specially commissioned, or does he? What is the definition of for? For, emphatic or at end of clause for. For, chiefly before it. First meaning is that it's a preposition, representing in place of, in exchange, against. If we go by that first meaning, we can read this line as saying, It represents the gentle, and in the context of the times, gentle meant largely high-born Shakespeare. Or, it is in place of the high-born Shakespeare. Finally, it is in exchange for the gentle, bracketed, high-born Shakespeare. In other words, this figure is an exchange for a noble Shakespeare. As in, we always say, I want to exchange this faulty equipment for something that works. Or let's switch the summer tires for winter tires on the car. In fact, we can substitute gentle for the word that. As in, this figure for that Shakespeare. This for that is proper grammar. He explains that the artist had to fight with nature to outdo real life as it is exaggeration. The graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Nothing could be simpler than saying he is exaggerating what the real writer was like. He uses asterismos in the next couplet when he says, Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass. If we would have been able to draw the writer's learning accurately in this figure, the print would have outdone all monumental inscriptions. This is an example of the rhetorical figure of Oxesis, enhancement of importance. He says, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. Brass is repeated for an example of the rhetorical figures in Tanaclasis or Metonymy, in which the word means different things each time it's used. This first brass stands for the metal used in the engraving. This brass substitutes for monuments. In other words, if he could draw on his wit as well in the metal as he had hit his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in monuments. And he, the artist, has hidden his, the writer's, face. This is the first sign of deception in the front matter, meaning that he is wearing a mask. Let's return to the verb form of the figure in which we ask whether or not the figure is a symbol of, a cipher, 
appears, pass for, assume character of, or be conspicuous. We can therefore assume the definition of figure is to be a cipher. To pass for or assume the place of the real author and be conspicuous. This is absolutely the truth of the matter because in all of Elizabethan and early Jacobian printing, there is never a portrait like this one for any book published within 200 years. The head's too large. There are plenty of enigmas and anomalies that would make things more like a caricature. He was also wearing a mask, as he, meaning the artist, had hid his face. Johnson had to use hit to rhyme with wit. So he used the alternate spelling of hid in order to be a bit ambiguous. The final couplet uses irony, in which he says one thing but means another. Reader, look not on his picture, but his book. Why would Johnson have gone through eight lines of carefully worded poetry to say, don't look on the picture, even though he has described exactly what that picture was for, and the fact that the artist has hidden the real author's face, if not to say, Look closely and try and figure out this portrait. Notice too that the uppercase letter R in the last section of the poem has a gematria value of 17. And there are 40 characters from the R to the end of the poem. Therefore, the couplet hides another 1740 illusion. Since he is wearing a mask, the name is not that of the real author. Let's look at the strange blurb, published according to the true original copies. What is meant by true original copies? This is an example of the rhetorical figure of amphibology, which means ambiguity. This is the second hint of deception in the front matter. Copies are not originals, which means they are not really the true items either, unless this true original describes handwritten manuscripts which were rewritten as copies by Scriveners. Here is evidence from the records of the stationer's office that the editors received handwritten manuscripts. This is from the stationer's register of March 27, 1635. Entered for their copy under the hands of Mr. Morgan Jones, Mr. Weeks, and Mr. Rothwell Warden, for a book called Archaeon, or the High Courts of Justice in England, being the true original copy from the author's executor. This is note H on page 72 from W. W. Gregg's book, The Shakespeare First Folio, published in Oxford, 1969. And it is Stationer's Register's Office, SRO 9382. The author was William Lambert, who died in 1601. Thirty-four years later, his book finally gets registered to be printed. So what does this mean? The printer would have received the original manuscript using the same phrase as in the first folio. What the editors got for the first folio were therefore Scrivener's copies based on the true originals, the handwritten manuscripts. 
This explains sentence three from the letter to the great variety of readers. His mind and hand went together, and what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. One way to correct handwritten manuscripts was to blot out the ink from the paper. They were also his papers, not those from the king's men or some printer, but from his estate. The otherwise extensive Stratford will does not mention any valuable manuscripts or even expensive writing tools. We can conclude from the evidence that the 18 new plays from the first folio were not from the Stratford man's estate. Because they were rewritten from original manuscripts as copies by Scriveners. Therefore, the clue is that the figure is not a true likeness. To sum up, the dedication ironically refers to an exaggerated figure in the poem, and we see deception on the title page. The word for tells us that the engraving was a replacement for the real author who was a noble writer. The plays were likely written by this man whose code number is 40, and he was the 17th titled head of his family. Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Thank you for watching. Stay safe.